Okay, here we go. Hey, Norman, would you pray for us? God, thanks for this day and for the, the beautiful weather. Um, for the little bit of rain we've been getting here and there, we appreciate it. Um, and I just pray that we'll all be focused tonight, have open minds, hear what you have to, to tell us, and learn what there is to learn. And I just thank you for this church body. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Listen, before we continue into chapter 12, let's revisit something briefly in chapter 11. And that would be, again, the identity of the two witnesses, because it's, it's just a, such an um, interesting uh, concept that there's these two groups or individuals that show up and do something. And, and uh, somebody had mentioned uh, last Sunday uh, that um, something that is often taught, that it, that it is somehow likely Elijah and Moses that reappear. And I thought, you know what, I, let, me, let me speak to that and just let you know why that is probably the most common uh, description that is taught, okay, in, just in case you're curious. Uh, so instead of reading it over again, just um, you can scan it as I, as I talk to you. I told you uh, last week that some people say it is um, Israel and America. Because we're the two countries really founded on the truth of God, and, and and somehow to the world, I mean, we're the we're the pain in their necks. Think about it. Okay, <clears throat> we to them come off as we're. I mean, we're we're just we're we're either um, using up all the Earth's resources, uh, or we've got all the bad ideas, or we're the ones who colonize everything and it's uh, take it over, or um, <clears throat> as we talked about. Of and countries all over the world, their capitals are, you know, they've got the late, uh, they stay up late with the, what do you call it, the, the candlelight burning, trying to figure out what in the world they're going to do with Israel. Uh, because it is, as the Bible says it would be near the end of, of time, this stone that everybody's going to stumble over, all the nations are going to stumble over. Now, there's another thought that um, it is, they are the Jews and the Christians. <coughs> Okay, that somehow just the Jews and the Christians, and I'm just talking again, again, so much of this, um, there's, there's a combination of symbolism and realism. But one thought is, uh, the Christians and the Jews to the world, uh, we're, we're detestable. We are a pain in their neck. Um, uh, the world would like to get rid of us because they think you'd be better off without us, and that the Antichrist system will come against the Jews and the Christians, which it will, and get rid of us. And so as it's described, is it somehow, you know, the Antichrist system kills us, and everybody gloves and is celebrating, and this is happy because we're, we're being killed. That's another one. Okay. Um, and then the idea of being Elijah and Moses... You know, consider Elijah was held to be the greatest of the prophets, just as Moses uh, was the supreme lawgiver. And it would be fitting, you might say, that these two outstanding figures in the religious history of Israel would be God's messengers of the last time. Uh, it's these two that appear uh, with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, so that kind of sets them aside. You think of all the people that could have showed up with them. It's these two. Um, the things said about them fit Moses and Elijah as they fit nobody else. Um, it, it said in Revelation 11.6 that they have the power to turn water to blood to smite the earth with, smite the earth with all plagues. That's what Moses did. When you think of Exodus 7. Uh, it said that fire proceeds out of their mouth, burns up their enemies, that they could shut up the he heavens so that no rain falls. Well, that's what Elijah did. Uh, if you remember, when the companies of soldiers kept coming after him and he'd call fire down from heaven and just burn the guys up. Uh, he's the one that prayed that the uh, uh, the earth would not rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years. <clears throat> okay, interesting. Um, uh, Elijah is expected to return anyway uh, as a herald, you know, before the end. That, that's the very end. That's in Malachi. Before the great terrible day of the Lord will return, you will look for uh, Elijah. He will come. Now, of course, people ask uh, John the Baptist, are you Elijah? No. They ask Jesus, are you the Elijah to come? Uh, Jesus says, no, it's not me, but it was John the Baptist. 
Um, so, um, either the first appearance of Jesus, the first coming of Jesus, um, that Malachi is referring to, and the John the Baptist that precedes the Messiah's first appearance was uh, John the Baptist, or it's a both and that refers to the first time Jesus comes and the second time he comes, because if one of these witnesses does turn out to be Elijah, well then you understand that um, Malachi was speaking both to John the Baptist and one of the two prophets, even though it's only talking about one prophet returning before Jesus comes, Malachi, and it would be specifically Elijah. Am I losing you there? Are you with me? Uh, Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is where God says, I will send your people another, pe another prophet like you. Moses. Uh, somewhere in the future. Some folks will take that and say, well, that must mean, you know, or we, they connect the dots, they say that must be the second witness here in uh, chapter 11. So uh, that is why that's thought of, is the, of, of those two. Now I asked you, you know, well, last week, if you had any thoughts about it, anybody had any thoughts about the witnesses and who they might be? Does it have to be somebody? Could it be somebody new? It could be somebody we've never met. Never <laughs> met. <laughs> I lead to that. Look at what Billy Graham was able to accomplish. And he wasn't even one of those guys. And I appreciate you saying that. Because often we look to the past and we say, you know, nothing could have been better than that. You know, we look at the glory days of the church, you look at, you know, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, the church is new, the church is growing, the church is doing so great, and Peter and you know, the day of Pentecost seemed to be great. Yeah, but how about Billy Graham? I mean, millions of people heard the message, millions came to Christ through that ministry. Greater thing you will do than I do, Jesus said. So, I, my 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 take is that it's somebody it's somebody that we haven't met yet. They're just going to appear, and the, the God doesn't have to go back in time and, and somehow reincarnate or just put on earth, you know, people that lived in the past. Um, I, I think what what it refers to is that again, it, it talks to the Jews. Again, this is written to Jews, uh, messianic believers that could even interpret to the Gentile believers now, Christians who don't have the Jewish history, to understand that, that what John described is very much the, um, the things that Moses and Elijah were famous for. I think it's very much on purpose that John writes those very things, and that I was shown to him that these two witnesses, when they show up, man, they're going to plague the earth. They're going to hold off the rain. They're going to do all these things to make life really tough. Well, that's what Moses, that's how God used his prophets in the past. Moses and Elijah's. Especially those two. All right. So I think John is just saying, look for it again. But it's going to come in a greater measure. It's not going to be an isolated location, geographical location on the map in the Middle East. It's going to be all over the world. Any power they have, wherever they want to hold, you know, withhold rain and, and do whatever. And, and that, um, I think it's very interesting that, again, instead of, you know, in the first plagues that fall, the, when, the, when the seals are being hot and the trumpets are sounding, you're seeing... Um, uh, nature respond. But when two people, and I think they'll be actual individuals, not groups of people. That's my take. Um, and, and this is why. is because the world is going to be mesmerized by the Antichrist. The world is going to be mesmerized by the miracles of the Antichrist that the Antichrist isn't doing yet. The first thing the Antichrist is going to do uh, or, you know, the system is killed the witnesses. But it's temporary. And for the witnesses to come back to life is to say, we're superior to you, there's a power superior to the power that this guy has. And off they go. And then God takes them to heaven. And then the world has to decide, do I want to go where these folks just went? Do I want to, you know, gamble with this other individual? Any thoughts? <clears throat> so would you say that the two prophets lived during the first three and a half years? Again, you know, that's what's interesting. It it, it, it appears that they are there for a while during the during the first half. They're not there during the second half. Um, so when we, the Antichrist comes on the scene abomination of desolation sets up in yeah. the temple, then he kills them. Then they say, uh-uh, they come back. Like you said, we got a greater power than you. They're gone, and then the rest of the world 
has to decide if they're going to follow this guy. Mm -hmm. and, and they've been witnessing the Christians aren't, aren't being touched. But the whole time, they're, I mean, because remember, you're seeing this. Either it's, it's the elect, the 144,000, or um, in chapter 9, verse 3, it's, it's the servants of God that are sealed on their foreheads. They just have the sign that they're not being touched by these scorpions. Okay. So, um, the world is watching, just like, did I mention this, you know, back in Moses' day, you've got all the Egyptians who are uh, in this isolated, this, this geographical location, all the terrible things are happening to them, but nothing's happening over there. You know, they look over to the slave, the slave camps and they go, why, why isn't it dark over there? Why, why aren't their livestock dropping dead? Why don't they got boils? Why isn't it hailing over there? Why did the locusts skip their, their food pantries? Why don't they got frogs? And the hardness of people in rebellion to God is going to overlook that. And if anything, they just get mad at that. And they, that just becomes one more thing they get mad at. We don't just, see any hardness like that today. <laughs> I mean, no, of course not. No. So we're clearly not nearing the end of that. Um, one real quick thing. I just saw that Syria fired a whole bunch of missiles at uh, Israel here in the last hour, I guess. In the last hour. Really? Trump pulled out of the Iran. Yeah, he did. Yeah. God bless Trump. Yeah. Love Donald Trump. Pulled out of the Iran deal. That was such a bad thing. So is this retaliation again on that? Um, I think it was a real short article. Syria. It just had a little video. Mm -hmm. All you see is just really nothing but rockets going up. So well, you could see it. Who knows? Is there uh, is the uh, the dome the uh, Iron Dome? Iron Dome. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, God's been watching over Israel for a while. No, it's amazing. Israel is a miracle nation. <laughs> they really are. They're the, they're the best. They were, when they pulled out and they had that news, um, uh, Netanyahu was telling everybody to open up their bomb shelters mm -hmm. and be ready. Okay. How's that? That was last night. Okay. You want to go to Israel and not scare me? I got a call from Jerusalem. There's a couple of videos for that. Yeah, they wanted to send me an article about the United States citizens joining IDF for a time to be able to come back and say, no, this is what it's like. Yeah. You guys don't know what you're talking about. So I told Joseph about that. Really? Let's go. Let's go. Can I take a 46 year old? Yeah. Let's go. You hear that? See, and, and that and, and that interesting because somewhere, I mean, we get the idea that the way I interpret it is that somewhere a bunch of people are going to join Israel. And we're going to go to Israel. We're going to get inside of Israel, and we're going to turn outside, and we're going to fight. We're going to help fight and defend Israel. And, and I think America, you know, Americans will be there. That's very interesting that they're inviting folks to hey, join the IDF for a little bit. I think that's awesome. <laughs> All right, well, Revelation chapter 12, very interesting. I'll tell you, before we um, try to take it apart piece by piece, I think it's really important that we read it as a whole. Um, so, would anybody like to, with dramatic accent, read all of chapter 12? It's a long one. You need to do that. You got to do that again. Yeah, 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 I can read it in Tegok. <laughs> read it in Tegok? <laughs> By the way, did y'all hear that? That was, yeah, that was a real language. They were speaking what they, uh, that was their thing. That was a, don't you wish you had a secret language, you and somebody, so you could do that? I hate when they do that. <laughs> we'll be in some room, they go, ding, 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 ding. and they'll do the bad, and then I go, <laughs> and you always think, they're talking about me or something. Uh, you know, we whisper, but that's rude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Jeez. Jeez. I can relate to that. My mother and her brothers and sisters would start talking German and none of the rest of us. Oh. What was going on? Oh, that's tough. That, that Ruthie's family, her, her folks speak Romanian. You know. Yeah. Who so speaks exciting. Romanian? Yeah. Romanian. And then they bust out and that stuff. Like, oh, I speak some Spanish. So. Hey. Take three pain attacks. See what's happening? <laughs> See what's happening? <laughs> Look at my shoes. white legs, my white shoes, my girl socks, and my short legs. Hey, hey. I'm great. Damn. Hey, the great. I like those. 
All right, well, here we go, chapter 12. A great horde appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. Then another horde appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. On his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child, so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God so that there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. That's uh, three and a half years, everybody. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, and they were defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens, and all those who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you with great wrath, because he knows his time is short. So when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the eagle, so she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time. As again, that's this three and a half year thing. Then from his mouth the serpent poured water like a river after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her children. The rest of her children. Those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. The water breathing guy. There it is. Oh, water, 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 I'll call you back when I get home. Oh, okay. So, Bye. John's got this amazing vision. And it starts with what? First thing he sees. Okay, yeah, there's a pregnant woman uh, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, on her head was this crown of 12 stars. Um, do you know what that is? Got an idea? Israel. Okay, the 12 stars, be the 12 tribes. Okay, the, this woman, do you have an idea of who she might be? Is she Israel? Some folks think um, it's Mary, the actual mother of Jesus. I think I told you before that, that uh, Revelation tw chapter 12, it, it is one of two things or it's both things. It's either the Christmas story from heaven's perspective. Or it is that and uh, it is something that takes place uh, again during the tribulation. And it's interesting because it really can apply to both. It's very interesting. Uh, but here, here's the deal. If it's, if it's Mary, well, the Mary we know is not kind of supernatural like this. She doesn't, I mean, it, it, it's a stretch for, the, for, for Mary. Um, there is the thought that it's the Christian church. Well, the church didn't give birth to Jesus. Jesus gave birth to the church. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what gave birth to Jesus, who is the Messiah, first and foremost, again, we're, we're Gentiles. All, we just see him as Jesus, the Son of God. You're a Jew. No, he's the Messiah, first and foremost. That's what you were waiting for. That's who he is. He's the Messiah. That's his first claim to fame. That's his position. And, uh, so it would be Israel. This woman... Um, uh, God often in the Old Testament calls uh, the nation by as 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 a bride. Okay, in the New Testament, same thing. The church is now the bride; it's no longer the nation. Okay, 
but same thing. Uh, and she's, she's, she's the bride of God. Uh, yes, there's the 12 tribes. That, that could be what it is. Other theologians have said, no, these are the 12 zodiac signs. And John took from what was also actually common and known in that day. With this, this sun above, this, she's standing on the moon, it's under her feet. Well, there's these ancient goddesses, and that's kind of how they were described. And, and he was using code language by kind of tying in everything that talked about a deity or described deity back then. And, uh, and, and that's, that's what he was pulling together. I'm just, I'm just letting you know. And by the way, tonight, as we go through this, let me know if what I go into gets boring. <laughs> if, it, if it gets kind of seminary-ish. Has anybody gone to seminary? The seminary can be really boring. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What do you call it? Sleepinary? Or if people call it cemetery? Cemetery. Great. Uh, my commentary, other than the, the, the woman representing Israel, it says it might represent the believing messianic community. That is another thought. That is just been, God's is your faithful people. And, and then she is taken. And, you know, maybe. And, and the, the only, just, and, and I, that, that, is, that is a thought that is held by some because um, uh, we're, we're talking about her being uh, snatched away taken to this place of safety, folks would say, well, it's, it's the church being raptured. The problem is, um, it ends um, chapter 12 ends with um, the dragon was angry with a woman went off to make war with the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. So the ch so it's not Mary the woman that's the church, it's, it's the people then described there. So we come from Judaism, right? That's our roots. So I mean, and that, you know, I've said this before, but think of yourself as Jews. Stop thinking of yourself as Gentiles. You're Jews. You're Jewish. Not by blood. You're not Hebrews. But you're Jews. We're grafted in. We're grafted in. We're grafted in. We're grafted in. And and so again, you know, I I, I I like to look at the Bible through Jewish eyes. And guess how you do that? Think Jewish. Study Judaism. Um, study Jewish. Uh, uh, literature, um, study Messianic Jewish theologians, and, and you'll see the Bible differently. Because most people read um, Christian commentators. We just read Christian Gentile commentators. It's good, but there's something usually, in addition to, it deeper if you read Messianic commentators. So that's that's where usually you know, that that's uh, that, that's the route I, I like to go, just because it just gives you something different. A really good source for that is uh, Zola Levitt's ministries. He's right. He Zola died, Levitt. but uh, all his sermons are still on online. Oh yeah. my gosh, it's just incredible. Yeah, there, there's a depth there, isn't it? You just go where you and your stuff you're not taught in the church. Z O L A. Yeah, Zola Levitt. Thank you, Mike. I think, I think I had experienced that maybe for the first time at Watchmen on the Wall last year. Ah. When we had two. Jonathan Kahn, three. Rabbi Kahn. Yeah, we had three. three. Yeah, we had several. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Jewish. Yeah. Jews. Oh, it's great. When, when a Messianic Jewish oh, boy, rabbi man. teaches you all. Yeah. Where I've been. Yeah. It's, 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 it's you, like, you, you feel like, wow, I just got catapulted back in, 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 in the time of Jewish history. And, and you just, it's, it's richer, it's deeper, you understand it more. It's amazing. Is this your first? Well, um, we, let's keep going. Um, look at, uh, kind of coming from the, again, from the, from the top. Um, We can agree who this red dragon is, three. The, the dragon is spelled out in, um, in nine. Okay. So we get this fantastic picture first, and then it's, then it's spelled out a little more, uh, who, who it's referring to. And um, uh, this great red dragon, uh, verse four, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth. 
Um, we're going, well, th this is a third of the angels that he has deceived, um, that he, um, uh, that come against God. Uh, that, that is, that's the interpretation of it, and I think it's quite accurate. Um, the dragon stands before the woman who was about to bear a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. Again, you know, he uses Herod when Jesus is born to kill, to try to kill Jesus. Um, he is right there um, when uh, Jesus is, um, you might say, giving birth to the church, or when Judaism when Jesus, let's say, closed down Judaism as the old way and says it's, it's now the new covenant is in my blood and here's the new DBA, we're doing it through me. Um, and, and right away, right at the beginning of Christianity, there's, there's a war against Christians. Some folks think that's what, what that may be. Um, but um, verse 5 she gives birth to the son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Clearly this is Jesus. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. So this isn't referring to, uh, you know, when they took the little departure in Egypt for about, what we think could have been up to seven years. Uh, but this is the ascension of Jesus. That um, there was the attempt on his life. And again, watch folks, it's very interesting. When we, when we look at the entire picture of the death of Jesus, we understand that was God's will. We, we understand it in prophecy. At the same time, um, we see Satan's involvement. And you, you've got Judas, that Satan enters into Judas, and Jesus says to Judas, what you've got to do, go do quickly. And he goes and he, you know, he tells the soldiers where to come, get Jesus, and arrest him, and all of a he's crucified. So, you know, we teach two things. Satan was out to kill Jesus, and he was responsible for the cross. God ultimately actually was responsible for the cross because he was looking for the, the final perfect lamb to die for the sins of the world. Which one is it? Is it both and? Did the devil think in some way that somehow if he was going to kill Jesus, if he, somehow if he could like T-bone God's plan, he could like really make sure Jesus like wouldn't resurrect. Like what if I can somehow kill him first before the Father's perfect timing or something on the cross? And maybe there's this magic hour that maybe I can, I can intercept, I can get in there, and then I can, once he's dead, I can take him and take him to hell with me. Because now he's mine. See? Um, because the devil's involved in it. The devil wants him to die. You know, apparently so. But we also look at the temptation of the wilderness, the 40 days, and you've got, you've got the devil trying to get Jesus to worship him and saying pretty much... You know, don't worry about going to the cross. Just bow down to me. I'm going to give it to you. You know, you don't have to go through all the suffering and all the stuff that Daddy wants you to do. You know, I, I'm just let me let me just uh, just bow to me. I'm going to give you everything. I'll give you all the kings of the kingdoms of the world. See that? So okay, so Satan wants to have Jesus bypass the cross. It's very clear Jesus is not going to take the bait, and he's and he's there in the in the garden, and and you know the devil's right there. I'm sure in the garden putting the pressure on, adding to the to what Jesus is feeling. You know, because Jesus is fully God, fully human, and as fully human, he has real pain, real fear, real human pain and fear about what's going to happen, right? He's just bleeding, he's, he's, right? He's got uh, blood coming out of his, uh, out of sweat on his forehead because he's bur bursting capillaries. He's in such fear and anxiety because he knows, as God, as Jesus being God, he knows exactly what he's about to endure because he knows what the human body can, can feel. And he made the body, so he knows what he's going to endure on the cross. And so he has a, a human response for the knowledge of God that he has. For what the human frame is about to endure, his frame. But he chooses, of course, to go through it anyway. Isn't that wonderful? So perhaps right there, the devil goes, okay, well, I couldn't talk him out of it there with that. Okay, well, then maybe I could do something. I mean, again, we don't know the Bible doesn't say that. So I'm just, I'm saying that in the Bible, we've got both God responsible and the devil is involved in trying to kill Jesus. In Revelation 12, he's seen as trying to kill, he's trying to take out Jesus. It says, the, the, the male child was taken to heaven and to his father's throne, to the throne. Well, that's, that's got to be the ascension of Jesus. So maybe after the resurrection, did the devil, was he wanting to do something else? What 
We don't know. We don't know. Again, this is a fan, it's a fantastic uh, book with, with, uh, with things that we just won't know yet. Either way. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Where, where did the idea of a dragon come from? Does your, does your version say dragon? Mm -hmm. Some say Zora? Dinosaur? Antichrist. Okay. Yours says Antichrist? Isn't that right there in that, where it says on? Um, well, it says it down in the bottom. Okay. Beast, no beast, as yet has uh, been mentioned. This beast symbolizes the Antichrist. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just say, here's something just, just to, to keep in mind. Uh, again, verse 3, this, this great red dragon shows up. Uh, the dragon stood before the woman to devour. Okay. Uh, verse 9, that great dragon was thrown down. The ancient serpent was called the devil and Satan. Okay. The, the imagery of, of the dragon, when you read that, what you're reading is Leviathan. It's, again, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's synonymous to the creature that they had seen and I would dare say was probably alive still in their day, or at least the recent stories, the most recent stories of the guy. Do you remember we talked about this? Uh, Genesis chapter uh, chapter one and two, when we were studying that on Sunday morning. Okay, I, I told you outside of the Bible, ancient people around the world they told of heroes, you know, who killed large reptilian creatures, uh, and and those accounts they're about as numerous as, as the flood legends around the world, um, and and ancient Europeans. They call the monsters dragons. That's where the word comes from. And so when our English translations were made with the King James Version and subsequent translations, we, we, they kept with the, the word dragon because it was an image of this creature. Uh, the book of Job again. It's written a few centuries after the flood, but it writes about two of them, right? The, the greatest land animal, behemoth, the greatest... Uh, thing that he, he made to demonstrate his power, and it, and it survived the flood, or it, it was a small thing, maybe it was the little baby one, the juvenile one, that was maybe hanging out on the, the roof of the ark, tanning or something, <laughs> for the year, getting big, um, you know, uh, and some, and it comes off the, you know, the ark, and it's alive, and then there's Leviathan, the semi-aquatic creature, right, from Job 41, and, and I'm telling you, uh, these things were so real, and they were mentioned so many times. And if you remember, I told you, King David saw the species. So did Isaiah. Um, in, in Isaiah 27, verse 1, he mentions Leviathan and a dragon in the sea. Again, that's a translation of if it's behemoth. Is it Leviathan? We're not totally clear, but I'm simply telling you what, what John does, he takes the name of the most frightening creature that people know of, either the legends of it or they have seen it, however few they may have been when John is writing, if they were there. But he writes about them, and, and notice he puts a bunch of heads on it. So this is Leviathan on steroids. That, that's, the, that's just the image. And to, to help people understand how, how terrible this dragon is, but then you know, it's just a great image for his readers as to what the devil might represent. Is that okay? Okay. Um, oh, where should we go? All right. Um, the woman has fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God so that she, she could be nourished for 1,260 days. What do you think of that? If, if, if the woman is the nation of Israel, which I think that's really what that is in the greater context, what does that mean in the wilderness? Child is just caught up to God into his throne. 